as we continue talking about geomorphology, we're going to talk about another important shaper of the landscape, rivers. We're going to be talking about rivers and as we term them, their fluvial processes. And we can see in such an, one of their important processes, you know, kind of how they shape that landscape, of course, through large floods that we're seeing with this intro slide. So many of you who maybe grew up in the Willamette Valley, uh, if you're a traditional age you know, student now, maybe you know, we were born about this time, um, but maybe if you're a little older, you could have even lived through this event, uh, the 1996 floods here um, it, that happened across much of the Willamette Valley. You see, you know, much area flooded across uh, the Willamette Valley in this extent. Um, so we're going to be talking about floods as part of rivers and some of their processes uh, as we have. And so for this video then, uh, correspondingly, our song to get us in the mood is What the Water Gave Me by Florence and the Machine. So again, we're talking about geomorphology. This ties back to some earlier lectures. Again, this is that origin, evolution, kind of how do we get to a landscape that we presently see. And so you know, our goal is to understand these processes that are shaping and moving around uh, Earth's surface and making the landscape look the way it does. And so, again, we've talked about some of these processes with erosion, you know, that movement of material. So water, in this case, is just another way for us to erode material and transport it and deposit it somewhere else, like our mass movements that we saw prior. And so, in this case, we're going to really be thinking in a source to sink kind of way, as we see in this lower right hand side. So it's generally from our highest elevation locations, so mountains, generally, and you know, eroding those slopes um, with water flowing over them from precipitation. Um, so you know, eroding that material down, transporting it down slope, downstream, and we have actually into rivers, um, and eventually getting it down to sinks, uh, you know, places where sediment is deposited. Um, and usually that being places like river deltas that are out along oceans or in other floodplain areas as we'll come to talk about. And so generally, eventually, over long, long time spans, again, that meaning thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of years, depending, um, you know, moving material, eroding it across in, in landscapes and eventually trying to deposit it in what we term the base level or an ultimate sink level for sediments, that being things like oceans or uh, other local base levels like lakes. And so any water that is flowing over uh, the landscape will be defined in flowing in what we term a drainage basin, which also goes by names such as watershed. Um, and so this is just the area that is uh, drained by a main river and its tributaries. So I gave you the example of the Willamette River earlier. Um, and so we can see this, some, the example of that here kind of in the center of this. And so that would know, be the main stem of the Willamette, but also its tributary. So all the rivers that essentially, you know, we also give different names, you know, human, you know, as humans, we name them, but um, any, you know, all those sets of different rivers that kind of join up with the main river that we term the Willamette, but you know, many of the many other rivers that flow into this. So we can kind of see this lightly tanned area um, here and showing all the rivers that flow into the Willamette. And so all that being termed the Willamette River's drainage basin, or its watershed, all the area that eventually flows into the Willamette River, which itself is uh, a, a kind of tributary of the Columbia River. So we see on the bottom right here, actually there's a much larger span if we want to term all this the Columbia River. So the Willamette River I and mean, many other actually relatively large rivers, the Snake River, for example, um, that starts in Idaho and flows through parts of Washington State, um, you know, and also, um, and, you know, all these places that we see, uh, you know, all these many rivers here are, that are all being part of this very large drainage basin as part of the Columbia River. Um, and so, and just noting that a watershed is defined where that uh, outlet uh, is set. So the Willamette River's outlet is the Columbia. Columbia's River, you know, outlet, of course, is the Pacific Ocean here. And so, just noting these difference between these, um, and really, in this case, where we're seeing, uh, talking, focusing on the Willamette, uh, the Cascade Range is acting as what we term a drainage divide, or it's dividing uh, the Willamette River from other drainage basins, uh, say, for example, to the east of uh, this, so mainly being the Deschutes River over here, that's more in central Oregon, where places like Bend are, and then a series of, of course, also coastal rivers that flow out mostly to the Pacific Ocean. <clears throat> 
is for example of you know these highest elevation locations so things like mountains or other large you know high ridges kind of divide, divide up where f rivers flow over the landscape now when we're talking about these rivers and we're talking about drainage basins also a couple other terms is briefly uh, familiarize ourselves with and be informed about uh, so kind of concepts of sediment yield and alluvium so sediment yield is meaning when we're having that when we're eroding that material we're essentially saying how much uh, erosion is occurring you know how much sediment uh, a material is being eroded out or what is the yield of it so what is the sediment mass so you could think a greater yield means more materials eroded off of the landscape and alluvium is just referring to that river deposited sediment so if you go out say on the Lamet River, really any, most any river, for example, you're going to see something like here, what we see on the right hand side, and see, you know, rocks that have been laid down there by uh, the river. And so, you know, this, the sediment yield or how much a river is actually transporting over you know, some given amount of time is actually influenced by many factors. So it's going to be influenced by things like, well, the precipitation, you know, how much water is actually flowing through that river is available to it to actually move material. Um, the relief or um, aspect, or excuse me, um, not aspect, but um, slope, excuse me, you know, how steep is the, the river channel in different locations, but also even other factors like vegetation, what is the rock made of, or human Im impacts can all be influential as well here. But just to note on the right hand side, just look at this picture here and note that actually this alluvium or river deposited sediments, one of the main factors that really um, helps to distinguish it is a lot of the material that gets laid down in different parts of the river channel all is relatively sorted to about the same size um, depending on how um, competent we term it or you know, essentially how much energy the river has to move different types of material and so we can see um, that on this what we term a river channel bar here on the right hand side we just would see kind of materials that's all relatively um, about the same rock size uh, as the river is about able to transport that amount or size of material in that case. Um, and so backing up here and also getting uh, ourselves familiar just with a few other terms, um, just fluvial uh, is actually the Latin word for river. So when we're talking about rivers, you may also hear about these fluvial processes. And so river channels, like we talked about with mass movements and other geomorphic agents like we'll talk about with glaciers, are a balance, of course, between this driving force, which is the water, and resisting forces, which is mainly the rocks that are lying on the um, bed of the river. And so that flow, of course, is driven by gravity as the water flows down slope. And as just noted in the last slide, that gradient or slope and you know, essentially the change in elevation along the river um, is going to determine essentially how much uh, that river is capable oftentimes of moving material or also how fast that water is flowing of course you think a steeper slope would um, lead to a faster channel um, and so noting that you know, those factors are really important here and moving water through but also even within the channel um, you know, there's kind of variations where we term the deepest part of the channel um, is actually oftentimes the fastest, so that's known as the thaw wig. And uh, the slowest is actually kind of on the sides or along the bottom, because that's where we can think you know, the water is running into, say, the, the rocks on the bottom or the material on the sides of the channel. So it's getting slowed down through that process. Um, so we can see that through this example here, um, we're, we're seeing where the fastest and slowest flow are. So this is showing you on the left hand side here of this what we term a top-down or plan form view of the river um, and then on the right hand side it will kind of these lines that are drawn across are known as river cross sections that are able to show you like if you were actually looking straight on actually with the river coming at you out of these pictures you know where we see again the fastest and slowest flow so noted as here you know, it depends on where you're flowing you actually have faster flow around the outsides of river channels and, and you know, the slowest flow around the insides of the channels and again fastest flow kind of near the top but not right at the top um, slower flow around the edges often of the channel or in you know, the waters running into um, that uh, bed river channel bed and such um, so again that's all important we'll actually come back to that in a little bit more and talk about those features that are formed by that um, but it's just a just to get informed of where kind of our faster or slower flows within a river channel. Though all this is taken together again through that slope and essentially amount of water flowing through 
to determine what is known as the stream power, essentially that energy that's available for a river to um, effectively erode and transport sediment through it. So um, I'm not going to go too much into depth here because I'm not going to um, push on to you know, too much of doing of any of this math, but um, to actually think about do, what river discharge is, which is the water or you know, the volume of water passing through a river channel cross section so that we just looked at in a certain amount of time. Well, really that discharge, we usually term that as a variable of Q, is equal essentially to the width, the depth, and the velocity of the river channel. So you know, how wide is the river? How deep is the river? We assume that the river is a roughly a rectangular shape in this case, and how fast is the water flowing through helps us determine through a given time, you know, essentially how how much water is is flowing through. Um, so you could calculate that all in, the, in these equations. Again, not going to um, um, go too much more into depth of it than that. But just to note that really this is how in the standard way um, you know, this river channel discharge or you know the amount of water that is flowing through is calculated here as shown on the right hand side here. Just to give you an example of how that's done. So again, because we know that river velocity is different in different parts of the river, kind of break it up into a series of sections, calculate that out for those different sections, as they take it together to figure out how much water is flowing through in any given time. And we can do that not by having to go out and resurvey at any uh, given time, although you can do that, but actually using what are known as these uh, stream, use, using what is known as stream stage, or essentially just the river height, um, once we know kind of the shape of the river channel, essentially just going back um, and essentially going and recalculating based on the height, its relation to those width and depth characteristics um, that we know of, and also then kind of measuring, um, just kind of remotely here through um, these, these materials, um, a also kind of a rough velocity, and that's able to then um, give you a calculation of what your discharge is uh, given any uh, stage or height, and simply of the water uh, column here. So basically by just measuring the height of the water um, here, we know we can have a rough estimate, uh, either shown on this example here, or just here's another example. You know, use what these rating curves, so again, where essentially it just tells you if we, if we measure uh, out on the river a height of a certain um, you know, feet, measure in feet or meters, we then will know what the discharge is of that river channel. And that's usually expressed in either, again, being a volume, either cubic feet per second, um, that's flowing through a cross section, or cubic meters per second, uh, if you're in metric units. So, and I, uh, really all this is based then off of, in turn, what we term the hydrograph, or which is a plot of discharge over time for a cross section. So again, um, we're, terming, we're thinking that this cross-section shape maintains over time. It doesn't change, um, but you know if we actually were just to have and have that stage measurement over time, you can relate that to your discharge. And if you just measure over long time periods, years and years and years, you can get something that looks like this hydrograph, for example. You see this again, just how the discharge uh, or you know how much water is flowing through changes over time. So we've seen this example from uh, late 2014 through part of 2015. So again, this really helped us then understand how river channels actually respond to things like precipitation. And so uh, that now I'll be talking you through an example um, that you'll be looking at for your lab. So as we cut over here to the lab, what we see is you, know, you actually be working with a few different uh, KML or KMZ files for this lab. So all those again that you're working with in Google Earth. Um, but for these first couple questions and tied to what we've just been talking about, um, you'll be most interested in using this Oregon and Texas stream gauge KML file. Um, you'll also be using the river types one for river types that we'll talk about later, and also some the Cedar Creek one um, for looking at slope calculations at the end of the lab. So again, just for this Oregon and Texas stream gauges one, you'll be using for these first couple questions. Where really you're just provided with this series of you know, this precipitation event that occurs here. Um, on some tributaries to the Willamette River and Lookout Creek here. Um, and you're going to walk through this, um, look at actually in those locations, kind of find the gauges here, um, and actually click through. Uh, you'll be able to enter through here. 
and you'll be directed to this USGS water um, uh, look, you know, water uh, data site, and you'll be able to potentially produce uh, and look at um, these you know, hydrographs for uh, these different locations here. So it kind of walks you through the steps uh, to actually do that. And I'm going to click, you know, so you'll be looking at begin date um, here, and you'll um, come up here to for your graph, um, find your begin date. In this case, um, so if we go back, our begin date here was 2016, 11, 19. So you can go back to 2016 here, uh, and then 11 November, so November 19th here is our begin date. And we go back, okay, um, or excuse me, that was our end date. So 2016, 11, 12, 2016, 11, 19. So that's an easy switch. Um, 11, 12, do, 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 go back, once again, remember, end date the 19th here, and as it directs us to do, you know, delete or deselect all of our parameters except for discharge, since we're just interested in discharge, so over here we have things like uh, measuring temperature, water, gauge, I don't need those, just need to want the discharge here, and then once we have that, um, since we're set on the graph, we want a graphical output to look at our hydrograph. When we hit go, um, you know, once it uh, you know, kind of sputters over this, as you scroll down, you'll be able to see essentially this you know, spike up of our hydrograph and then coming back down of this hydrograph here at Lookout Creek. Um, and so you know, you know, look through that, um, do the similar thing for this other gauge on the Mackenzie River, and we kind of look at how we have these responses. Uh, to these different precipitation events that is occurring here uh, to those. And similarly, um, you're looking at you know, kind of some of these factors we've been talking about, some different gauges uh, using some similar kind of calculations and you know, just walking through the steps here um, and, and making some summary um, observations from looking at some of these gauges and their discharges uh, on those locations. So again, as we saw with the lab material here, I'm um, here just with a hydrograph, you know, showing the plot discharge versus time. I'm um, here some examples to show you here that you know the average hydrograph shape will just really depend though on that location uh, and you know its cl relative climate. So you know, we've talked about climate in the past. So for example, see on the red line here, this could be an example of a Pacific Northwest kind of Cascades Mountains type river that's really determined by rainfall input where you get a lot more rain in the winter months that we can see here in an average winter month. Um, and so its discharge is going to be relatively much, much higher in those winter months compared to the summer months where we know, uh, you know, there's really not much rain to be had or not much precipitation to be had. And so there's, you know, the river channel uh, is much uh, less populated, you know, has much less discharge in those summer months. Where the blue line shows an example of a more spring-fed river, so a river that uh, being fed out of a slow kind of more, more trickling of water that's coming out of the ground and, but that's much more constant the river and isn't determined by that precipitation uh, component um, so we see both of these types of rivers um, actually very frequently um, within the Cascade Mountains and surrounding areas in Oregon um, but it's just to show you some different types of examples you know one river that's really imp impacted a lot by di um, precipitation um, for its discharge and another one that really is not and so, just to note here, in relation to that as well, that you know, these how hydrographs respond, and as we saw a little bit in the lab, as you'll know, be working through the lab here, um, that these hydrographs are dependent on several factors, and so some main factors to take into account. Well, one is simply the size of the watershed, and that has a couple of important impacts. One is meaning that generally smaller watersheds or smaller drainage areas have faster responses and what we could term a flashier discharge, meaning it rises really quickly and then it comes back down pretty quickly um, from precipitation events compared to larger uh, drainage areas that are fed by many of those smaller tributaries. So many of those individual small tributaries, again, all have that flashy, um, very quick input, lots of uh, precipitation spikes up um, in terms of the discharge and then quickly comes back down. Um, and so again, we're seeing that on the left-hand side here would be an example. Um, but the here's a right-hand uh, example where now we see a much uh, slower rise relatively in the uh, discharge uh, 
and uh, with a precipitation event, but also a much uh, more gradual fall of that discharge as well. So again, basically the rule here is uh, fast up and fast down for a small river like the Mohawk River that kind of feeds in over near Springfield. Um, but you know, here's the Willamette River, which has you know takes into account many of those different tributaries feeding into it um, down a little bit to the north of us, but downriver of Eugene, um, Harrisburg here, where you know, the river channel um, responds much more slowly to a precipitation event um, by cresting, but then also falls a lot slower as well. Um, and tied to that is also then just to note that you know, while the larger the watershed area, then also generally the much higher the discharge, because you know, the Mohawk River is very small, doesn't have very much area feeding into it, while its discharge is, um, you know, maybe only a few hundred cubic meters per second, which is really not relative very much at all compared to the Willamette River, which you see here can get up into 10,000 to 20,000 uh, cubic feet per second. So again, taking that into account as well. And even then, uh, as part of that, uh, other factors like urbanization, so thing, you know, paving over surfaces um, can also make that precipitation response much more flashy, flashy even for larger areas, um, and that can um, also uh, create things like um, much you know, flash floods or you know, other um, more fast flat, uh, flood hazard events. So you know, again, this is going to be important for some of these uh, parts of the lab that you're completing. But to move on from that, uh, and actually back to a little of the driving forces versus resisting forces, we're talking about water and sediment. Again, we're talking about uh, the driving versus resisting forces. And so here I decided to put in my clip of may the forces be with you as you're working through this. Um, but this, I, you know, kind of focus once again on the stream power aspect of it, where you have that driving force versus the sediment um, that is being eroded or that resisting force. And so there's really a few different forms of sediment transport going on here. So you have the, the bed loader, kind of those actual rocks themselves, I mean, you know, the bigger rocks that you're probably thinking of on a riverbed. But you also might have finer things like sand or really small. Um, sediments that can get more suspended, uh, especially in, in large floods within the stream. So this is when, you know, when the water's murky, sometimes you can't see that you know, that's because of suspended load. But also then even very, very tiny, um, you know, more down to the molecule uh, aspect uh, of what we term dissolved load as well. Um, these are all components of that, all that sediment being moved. And so just noting that, again, this the sediment is moved, that's just meaning that also then the shape and or location of the river channel is also being shaped or changed over time. And so you know, really what we're seeing is actually the river channel, any given river channel, kind of seeking a balance or trying to reach some sort of balance between these eroding and depositing uh, of, of, of material um, and trying to eventually reach what we could term a graded condition. Um, and so really just to note here that this balance that I'm showing you, what is known as Lane's balance um, in river uh, or fluvial geomorphology, is just describing out then how rivers respond to these different changes in the amount of water or sediment that they receive. And so we can think that if, say, sediment is added or and or water is reduced, well, then you end up having a condition where the river is being overworked. You know, there's not as much water as there was. There's like an excess of sediment. The river is no longer powerful enough to move it. And so that material will build up over time. And that is what we get a condition, what is known, as we see in the bottom here, as aggradation. And you know, generally the bed level, or just the channel generally, is being built up through that. Um, and we'll look at that again here in a little bit. Um, but then it, kind of in a reverse sense, well, what if we add more water, if we have greater stream power, you know, or if, say, sediment is, is reduced compared to the amount of water? Well, now the river has a lot more energy to expend compared to what it can erode, and so it's going to erode a lot more sediment. It's actually going to degrade or kind of you know, break down or um, make a bed level go down in this case. And not be eroding more, and eating away almost at uh, that sediment uh, uh, um, material compared to uh, you know other conditions prior. So you know that all is kind of nice in theory, but actually let's bring that to some real type of world scenarios where you might have this occurring. So uh, a couple examples that I'll give you here. Now first, give you the examples. Have you think about it for a second, and then kind of see if you can guess the right answer based on those principles we just went through. So 
if we have, you know, actually now again we're, we're in a condition where we have flow that's going through a channel, but then we divert some of it uh, for irrigation, so our river channel discharge is reduced. Uh, you know, what does that mean for our you know, lane, part of lanes balance? So if we think through that, well, okay, we're, dis we're um, our discharge is being reduced, so we have less stream power, right? And so if we have less stream power in this case, we think, you know, we're not reducing any of the sediment, so that means we have essentially less power to move all that material. We're actually going to have our aggradation there, right? We can think because we're building up of material, um, uh, going to have more depositing of sediment there because, you know, we just don't have enough much, much power anymore. We don't have any much of that stream power to move material. All right, well, that's, that's one example. Another example, what if we actually build a dam, and we cut off the sediment supply to the river downstream. So particularly, um, if we're thinking downstream of, the, of where we put the dam, what will happen to our river channel? Now, dams generally do, as we see for this example, with this example, say on the right-hand side of the Hoover Dam, they do generally release some less amount of water downstream. Um, so they are, you know, kind of reducing to some extent the uh, actual amount of water flowing downstream. But again, you can think of them basically acting as a wall against any sediment passing down past the point. So there's absolutely no, totally uh, devoid of actually any sediment coming in below that uh, dam as well. So we're, again, we're essentially cutting off that total sediment supply. So even more or less sediment than water now. And so because of that, you can think you can relatively actually the water that is available is much more powerful compared to the sediment supply that's available to it. And so actually oftentimes right below dams, we see that degradation or kind of, you know, actually incising of a channel, get cutting down, wearing away a lot of sediment, sediment uh, trying to you know, establish that, reestablish that lanes balance component uh, or equilibrium between the stream power and the sediment supply. So again, this is just back tying back to that idea of a graded stream, you know, always trying to be in kind of an equilibrium between that um, uh, stream power and the sediment supply. And again, we noted those components here. And really, just to note that this, when you think of this, you know, as an ideal concept, usually though rivers are rarely in that equilibrium state, they're more frequently adjusting to other disruptions and seeking balance. Um, and so, for example, some of our examples tied to stream degradation and aggradation. So just here where we can see um, rivers where degradation keeps pace um, with actually mountain uplift. We talked about this with orogenesis in the past, um, you know, where long time periods, if the river actually keeps pace, um, whereas kind of incises down into the landscapes, uh, that can be leave behind river terraces and these incised rivers. So the example, a uh, common example from Gooseneck Island here, um, you know, kind of a frequently cited example here. Um, you can see this also just more generally in this conceptual diagram here. Um, and you know, just to note, I won't really belabor this, but some you can go cover and think about here, look over some ways that river terraces are formed, you know, tied to, again, this or, 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 orogeny you know, tectonic uplift that we talked about uh, in the past as what well, is you know an important factor often in that but you know in the reverse sense stream aggradation you know, where we have material where our stream power um, kind of breaks down and is able to you know and ends up aggrading or building up um, river channel beds um, we see this more most frequently in actually kind of desert environments or other places where we um, end up building uh, what we term alluvial fans. So oftentimes when you have rivers coming through a mountain va uh, mountain valley um, and then kind of reaching a flat floodplain, the river um, spreads out, doesn't have as much stream power anymore, and ends up depositing all that material it was it was um, carrying in a, oftentimes a relatively steep mountain slope. And so this builds up a kind of fan-shaped material, um, or fan shape um, of that alluvial Material. And so you can see this again as in these images here. Well, you know, it's here in this forefront here, coming out of these more steeper mountains, and also seeing it here on this fan shape uh, of the topographic map that we're looking at here. So, again, most common in arid environments, see this, this example being from Death Valley, although it can occur in more humid environments as well. And so, this is just important because you've been looking at some of this as well for your lab in this module. 
on this Google Earth example, and then we'll come back to and be using for calculating out your slope. So you can see this example here, um, where you know, just you'll be making measurements, um, and we can go here and look at that. So we'll cut over here to uh, Google Earth in a second. Although, and you know, just to make sure we know what we're doing here, and just reemphasize this. Uh, calculating slope or gradient. So what we're doing here is uh, calculating essentially that elevation change uh, or that you know, slope component uh, um, you know, from that travel over a horizontal distance or horizontal change. So I have that this example here, you know, where we see our calculations. So we see, say, take along this uh, stream longitudinal profile here of you know river channel going over many, say, tens of kilometers or many, many miles. We say up here on this first location at Y, uh, you know, we have uh, our elevation at 3,000 feet, let's say, and then further down the river channel, uh, then we've uh, reduced to our elevation being at 2,000 feet, so we've lost, you know, 1,000 uh, feet of elevation. But let's say over that the horizontal distance, or you know, actually kind of distance on the landscape between those locations is 10,000 feet. And what we're seeing here then is, so we're taking that component, you know, our elevational change component here, uh, over, uh, essentially then dividing that by that horizontal change. So again, that 3,000 minus 2,000 feet gives us 1,000 feet uh, as our elevational change. And that horizontal change again is that 10,000 feet of lateral distance kind of actually on their surface. So we'd end up having, you know, for calculating our slope and gradient in this case, that, you know, a difference in elevation or 1,000 feet divided by that horizontal change or that 10,000 feet when you, you know, calculate that out that's equal to 0 0.1 or when you multiply 0 0.1 times 100 to get a percent you will end up with a slope of 10 percent so it's that slope value they're actually interested in calculating for some of these uh, questions within uh, the lab and again, when you enter those then within the lab um, just note as well that those uh, values that you're looking for so if you actually bring that up here um, and go to our component here, um, and we're looking at our lab. We can, you know, you can read through here uh, these last components of the lab. Um, but you know, when you're going actually and entering these in as values, um, just make sure that you're entering them in as just those numbers. So in that case, you're, uh, that I just walked you through, um, the example there would have been uh, you just enter 10 uh, for our 10 percent. And again, jumping then back to uh, actually how you will calculate all this out uh, on the lab. So you'll, when you actually load in the Cedar Creek file, as in, zoom it in here, you'll end up seeing these two lines, uh, this red line and this yellow line on top of this topographic map. And particularly with uh, these uh, lines, you can actually right click here, open you know, this menu, and you click show elevation profile. Again, it'll show you that longitudinal profile for uh, that uh, whole river channel along it. So actually when you drag here, you can see along this red line, you can go to higher elevations and then trace all the way down to lower elevations here. And particularly that's important um, and can also help you here because um, once you go back you know, and say we actually look at one of these questions, it's going to be asking you, okay, we'll calculate, say for Cedar Creek, which is that red line the fan from the fan at 18... 80 um, down to the end of the fan at uh, 1530 meters elevation. Um, so just noting that you know we're going to have our ele elevations um, there. And so noting, uh, you know, so you'll be able to find here. I'm um, so note this is all in feet at present, uh, but you can go in and end up changing uh, in your options here um, your um, different um, units of measurement. So here, you know, that's that system default. You can actually go in here and say change to meters and kilometers if you're not already there. So this will change all of your units here. And so now, once again, we can go back. And we had, uh, I believe, that our lower elevation there was 1530, and we'll be tracing up to 1880. So just note you're always tracing from the, actually, in this case, from the bottom to the top. Um, so 1530 here. So you see, you can click, hold down, and trace all the way up to that 1830. And then, so when you release that, uh, once you re re uh, get about to 1830 here, um, then you end, note you can it'll give you that distance, that elevation gain or loss, and actually it'll calculate, you know, and help you calculate out that slope here as well. So you'll be able to find, okay, distance traveled just about, uh, not just over nine kilometers, 
and then you can you know, have that your elevation uh, gain or loss within that component and so you can make that same calculation that we just went through um, get your uh, max and average slope here and so again you can you have to make some conversions here for kilometers but you know we have a uh, thousand meters within a, any kilometer so basically nine uh, kilometers would be nine thousand meters um, you know that'd be your again horizontal distance you could take divide 308 over that just over nine thousand um, make sure that it matches one of these values here and that'll give you then your slope as an example so that is one example there that gives you your um, working with uh, how to actually do those slope calculations all right so now we come back and the last part of this video will be focusing on some of the main channel types and their identification so either straight meandering or braided types of channels so straight as the name implies they relatively go in a straight line um, you can't have naturally straight straight channels although they're very, relatively um, uncommon uh, mainly you get them as examples on the right here where we get kind of incised uh, channels into canyons that force them into relatively straight paths but on the left hand side we can have also more artificially straightened channels um, by human activities so things like canals or other kind of human modified river channels are also oftentimes straight um, braided channels um, as the name once again implies they kind of braids they have multiple channels of them um, these generally and that's occurring generally because of really to really really high sediment supply compared to um, kind of the amount of water that frequently flows through them um, and so oftentimes and also relatively high or steep gradients um, and you know these forms multiple channels and then uh, what we term these mid-channel sediment bars that are exposed um, just big you know outcrops or more where all the sediment that's been deposited um, when these rivers you know kind of more infrequently are at flood stage or have a lot more water flowing through them and finally um, kind of may, perhaps the channel you might most type you might most think of when you uh, might see a river channel are meandering channels where we have these being more in you know, flatter floodplain areas you know, occurring in um, relatively lower sediment supply and lower gradient areas um, they form in these floodplains where they um, kind of once in a while flood out onto them and creating a series of landforms associated with that and they also you know, migrate or move uh, over time as we'll look at here and so with river channel migration in, the, in these particularly um, meandering channels we end up seeing again with that typical meander bend uh, it ends up cutting into you know wearing away on the outside of these bends and so on that side we call that that outer bank that cut bank and then kind of again we had that slower flow uh, uh, you know remember back from earlier in the video the slowest water is actually going to be on the inside and that because that water is moving relatively slow can't carry as much of that material that it might have been carrying from upstream oftentimes deposits it to, deposits it on the inside of the river channel so this is where we get things like the sand silts and gravels more building up as so we term that uh, that point bar and so we saw that on the earlier one of the earlier slides I was just talking you through when I talked with you through alluvium and that material kind of being sorted out uh, to relative sizes there depending on the stream power of the channel. So we can see this, you know, again, this wearing on the outside away of the of a time of a bend ends up you know, moving that channel over time, as we see here on the right-hand side in this plan form view. It eventually can even lead to this kind of, you know, when we have a big meander loop here, um, it being cut off eventually over time um, as the river channel meanders. So we see in this, in this animation here, as we watch, we have the river channel flowing, we have a flood or a large flow event um, and, and it breaks through kind of cuts off a whole big meander uh, part here um, and so we that uh, kind of separate component then um, that's actually no longer connected to the main stem of the river um, and it's you know over time will usually dry out is known as an oxbow lake until it dries out um, and then an oxbow scar afterwards because um, you can often see them on the landscape as we see on this example here so we see the main kind of river channel segment uh, of this here this river flowing here but many meander scars if you really look for them all over the place here on this flood plain um, you know that have been essentially our old cutoffs where they were removed cut itself off and then eventually you know um, that, that oxbow lake that was behind it uh, dried up over time the river channel you know just continued to meander and move around there so we conclude here also just coming back to flooding uh, being you know that major hazard for people living on floodplains 
um, and so it ties to uh, you know, in your um, pre and post module answer I got to talk a little bit about the National Flood Insurance Program or really that's where I'm talking about it here as really so some aspects kind of pros and cons to that uh, component of having insurance for you know, flooding that occurs uh, in different river landscapes so frequently things like the Mississippi River that can flood you know a pro of course is that it can help people recover from flooding that are living in these event or living in these areas that are more prone to flooding um, but of course kind of also the pro and potential con to that um, or that you know it may incentivize um, or a con to that would be that it would, oftentimes um, the way the system is presently structured ends up having people you know, maintaining or living in these areas that continue to repeat flood over and over and over again so it has no really incentive mechanism for them to be hazard averse um, and oftentimes you know is not getting them actually out of harm's way and another pro and or con being that um, the national flood insurance program also offers subsidized insurance in certain cases and rates compared to what more private insurance would offer so again that can be a pro for um, people who might not have financial means and times to you know, pay as much as they would under private insurance but also that and the kind of the con that comes out of that ends up being that uh, the program presently is billions of dollars in debt especially from very large flood events that um, end up costing you know, many billions of dollars in themselves things like Hurricane Katrina in the mid-2000s Hurricane Sandy um, across much of the eastern seaboard and there in 2012 um, and even more recent flood events as well um, and then you know other uh, co another con and possibly pro I'm um, talking about some of these erosional components that we just went through or something like well flood insurance maps hazards uh, only the, the flood hazard aspects but actually doesn't take into account any channel erosion so you know the con there is if you have a rapidly moving and eroding channel like these meandering channels you know your flood your real true hazard to the channel may not be you know, taken into account because you know we're not actually really worrying about how the river channel moves over time we're just wondering okay if it floods where will it flood based on oftentimes just past knowledge of where floods have occurred but you know you know that can also in a sense perhaps also be a pro because you know, we don't know we only have kind of understandings we have guesses you know kind of educated guesses where river channels will end up migrating over time based on these basic concepts and of course there's much more soil classes we could kind of spend talking about this you know, series of topics um, and your know, predictions of understanding a river channel erosion and deposition but you know just knowing that you know, that could also be kind of a con and or pro depending on these factors so I want you to you know, wrestle with some of those a little more think through that as well um, and just have some you know, tie that back into your short answer response for this module